So you wanna be a real estate investor, but where do you start? How do you know what information and sources to trust? That's where I come in. I'm Johnny Catani, and this is the Investor Relations Real Estate Podcast. Hey guys, real quick, before we start, go to investwithkatani.com and download my free ebook, Is Commercial Real Estate Recession Proof? Now to today's show. What's up, guys, and welcome to another episode of the Investor Relations Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Johnny Catani, and today I'm joined by Brian Ellis. Brian is a leading expert in capital raising and real estate and investments, whose work has been featured in Forbes, Entrepreneur, Street.com, and many other top-tier publications. He's also a publisher of the highly acclaimed magazines, Accredited IQ Magazine and Self-Directed Investor Magazine, and is host of the Million Plus Download podcast called Self-Director Investor Talk. Brian's most in-demand skill is his ability to help syndicators raise more capital for their projects far more quickly by creating educational, understandable, and even more importantly, highly persuasive pitch presentations. Brian's focus is on real estate projects, tech startups, and oil and gas projects. Brian, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Absolutely. Happy to have you. We were talking a bit offline, so I'm really excited to get into this because uh, capital raising is my main focus. Uh, I know you're familiar with uh, a good friend and mentor, Hunter Thompson. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I've been on his show as well. He's a friend. Yep, absolutely. So before we kind of jump into uh, the weeds here, kind of just talk about what led you to this and you know how you kind of acquired these, uh, these skills. Yeah, uh, so I, I was I, I've been in the real estate business for well over twenty years at this point. Sometimes it's been actually doing real estate deals, and sometimes it's been on the information and training side of the business. So uh, in one of those two ways, I've been in real estate for a couple of decades now, a little, little longer than that. And and along the way, I ended up building a, an email database of of people who are also interested in real estate investors and and. Kind of by happenstance, uh, I, I ended up being invited to participate in a project uh, well over 10 years ago now that in, involved me finding uh, some, some investors for some, some real estate investment projects. And uh, I did that. And that, that was kind of my uh, maiden voyage in, in raising capital. I knew nothing. I, I learned everything as I, as I went. But I did learn a lot, and uh, it was very successful. And I, I, I tried it another few times thereafter, and, and and it turns out that that really fits what what I I particularly enjoy doing, which is connecting people who have capital with projects where their capital can best be used and actually used very profitably. So that, that's how I got into this. Okay, awesome. I love that kind of a by happenstance. Now, listen. Any, I shouldn't say anyone can raise capital, but anyone can go out and for one particular deal, find the capital. But what really sets the, the difference between someone like you who can go out and raise, you know, we were talking offline, potentially, you know, 15, 20 million on demand and those who, you know, it takes three weeks for them to raise $2 million. So what, what is the difference? Is that, is that what you're asking? Yeah, right. What, yeah. What, what do you see as typically the difference yeah, so so there there are a, a couple of them. One one of them is that generally the person who can do it over and over again has built an infrastructure such that they have access to investors who are good prospects. Like they they don't they don't have to go and you know reinvent the wheel every time they need a, a, a new group of investors. So that's one thing. And another thing is that. The, uh, uh, people who are very good at it tend to have a very clear idea about how to communicate properly and persuasively to those people just because just because you have a database of investors, for example, doesn't mean they're going to say yes to any particular project, doesn't mean that they should say yes to any particular project. But if, if you have a project that you put before them and, and, and it is a good fit for them, but you didn't describe it in such a way where they choose to say yes, well, then that means you didn't do your job very well. So it takes both things. It takes the infrastructure, a group of, of potential investors, and the ability to communicate to them so that you put those two things together, and now you can raise money on demand. Okay, that makes perfect sense. So let's kind of get into the weeds there on that then. What does what does a good infrastructure look like? You know, obviously, it sounds like probably a CRM, kind of drip campaigns, keeping keeping you top of mind, 
So kind of get into what that looks like. Yeah, you know, I, I said infrastructure, and when, when I say infrastructure, I don't really mean necessarily the technology of it, although that certainly has has a an important role. What I mean more is is the uh, the 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 reality of having a relationship with a group of people who who can be uh, potential investors. So, in in my case, one of the ways that, that we do it is that we have this magazine called Accredited IQ, and Obviously, it's uh, targeted at accredited investors, which you know we we do almost all 506Cs and, and projects are require accredited investors, and so the 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 magazine that's entirely what the reason is, is is to gather those people together and to provide content to them such that on an ongoing basis that they know like and trust what we're doing, so that when the time comes they'll be interested in. in at least listening uh, uh, about a project that, that we might present to them. So that's really what I mean is, is, is have a way to gather a crowd, to get, gather a group of people together who, who uh, you give reasons to know, like, and trust you. Makes perfect sense. And what, what kind of various content um, are you guys publishing in the magazine, you know, to keep, keep these accredited investors around? Yeah, so uh, in, in an upcoming issue, we're going to be uh, talking a lot about uh, uh, assisted living facilities, because that's a pretty big, uh, uh, it, it, that's an asset class that seems to be of great interest these days. We're also focusing a lot on oil and gas these days for obvious reasons. There's a lot of, a lot of demand for that, still a lot of tax advantages to that, um, but uh, uh, so, so that. We, we do, we do some, some uh, routine things, just general economic analysis and, and, and looks at various a real estate uh, markets around the country because it's you know as anybody in the real estate business knows it's kind of silly to say the U.S. real estate market there there are dozens hundreds thousands of real estate markets in the United States so we we pick out individual ones and and we'll do a deep dive from time to time so it's that sort of thing that that the potential accredited investor would be interested in, in reading about anyway that's that's what we give them and that makes perfect sense and really you know. As a general blanket statement, to, once you get to accredited, obviously, according to the IRS, they assume you're a little bit more sophisticated, and therefore, the content that you need to be giving these investors is sophisticated content, right? Okay. We're kind of assuming we're past the, the blanket level stuff. They know what a syndication is. They know what that stuff is. So now it's really about the economics, like you said, the market focuses and things like that. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And sometimes we'll do basic intro stuff, but yeah, generally we're not going to have articles about what is a syndication. We'll, we we might have uh, uh, some some legal coverage that digs deeper into into particular parts of syndications or particular terms that that uh, accredited investors may not normally pay attention to that probably they should. We might do some of that. Okay, makes perfect sense. I mean, you know. Accredited investors, they may be accredited for the first time and, you know, they're new to the space. So it doesn't hurt to kind of revisit some of those basics as well. And that makes perfect sense. So we were talking offline, you know, we mentioned in the intro, your your main skill is, is that last minute, they can't raise the final amount of money, but you don't really go to your investors to help these projects. You're actually just going back to their investors and kind of representing. So kind of talk about that process and what that looks like. Sure. So it, it, I wouldn't say it's my main thing for doing last minute projects. That's my main way of getting first time clients. Um, uh, second time clients generally don't wait until two weeks before. Um, but uh, a very common scenario is my phone rings and on the other end of the line is a uh, is a syndicator who has a, a project and it's probably a pretty good project and let's say they have to raise $10 million uh, to, to get this, uh, you know, they got to raise 10 million in cash, it's probably a 30, 40 million dollar project total. And they've got an email database and they've been beating that database to death and they're, they've only raised four or $5 million. And they're two weeks out, you know, they're two weeks away as their drop dead date. So they, they've still got to raise five or six million dollars more. That's usually when I get the call. And what I do is uh, that we, we look at their project to make sure that we can help them because I'm not going to take on a project where, where, uh, where I'm not a good fit. But usually we can help them. And what, what I do in that case is that we uh, take all the information about their project and I rewrite their presentation. I create a new webinar, a new presentation 
everything about it's new and every single word of it is scripted. Like there, there's no variability. I write out every single word. We create every uh, piece of the uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation. And we generally do this in like one day or a day and a half because they're already in a time crunch. And, uh, but you, you ask yourself maybe what, why is that different than what they were doing? And, and the distinction is, it's, it's a very big difference. The distinction is that syndicators tend to talk about their projects as if they're a professor teaching a class about their project, when really what they ought to be doing is presenting their project uh, as if they were a closing attorney or even like an evangelist, or maybe a credible one, uh, and, and presenting not just the facts, but kind of the idea behind it, the narrative, the, the bigger overarching idea and interspersing into that all of the reasons why that investor who's on the other end of the line ought to be thinking about investing in it, not just sometime, but right now today. So that's what I do. I rewrite the presentation, then we rerun it to the very same database, the very same group of people from whom they originally raised their four or $5 million that they raised, because in, invariably they tell me the same thing. You know, we got to have some new investors. We, we got to have some new blood. We, we've taken as much out of our database as possible. And invariably, I find that's not the case. We are uh, quite consistently able to raise the money uh, that, that that syndicator needs from their own database, even though they weren't able to do it because they don't know how to communicate in a way that actually persuades people to, to jump in. Very interesting. Can you kind of uh, get little bit more in depth on kind of what that language looks like and you know like the difference between what they're saying and what you're saying not necessarily like verbatim but just oh, sure. kind of what that language is like oh sure well there's a very common example that i, that I point to in, in just about every syndicator presentation i've ever seen they all have spreadsheets in them and spreadsheets are uh fine you know you got to have that information and the reason they have that is because you know, you, you got to give that data to the potential investor that like you've got to give it to them like it's not an option. But who on a webinar really reads a spreadsheet? Like the answer is nobody. And if they do read it, they're not listening to you. So you kind of lose either way. And it's my experience, uh, even even though I am a uh, I'm, I'm an engineer by training, like I appreciate that people are, are interested in data like I get that. But it's my experience that just about any spreadsheet can be summarized by looking at the number in the upper left and the lower right, or you know the lower left and the lower right, just the bottom, bottom line numbers beginning and end. And that's the information you need, not all the stuff in the middle. Now you need that to make the decision and that ought to be in the PPM, but it shouldn't be in the webinar. Nobody's gonna pay attention to that anyway. Uh, that's really one common example. And you know, it, it just real quickly, another, uh, another example I see over and over again is that, at least nine times out of 10, most syndicators webinars start off with a photo of the syndicator and, uh, and a couple of paragraphs about them. And, and maybe uh, they probably do the same thing for every general partner. And you know, that's fine. Uh, I'm not saying that these things are wrong. I'm saying that there's, there's a, a different way that might work better. And, and a different way that does work better is to share the, the, the information about the people who run the project not all at the beginning, because people, you know, at, at that point, people don't care about you. Like, they really don't. They don't care one little bit about you at that point. Now, once you've gotten their interest in the project, then they're going to start to care about whether you're competent to run it or not. But until then, you're wasting your breath and you're boring them and you're losing them. So what you ought to do instead is, is intersperse that, that information through the project in a way where it, it's, it's like a narrative rather than a lecture. Got it. That makes perfect sense. So really, of course, you know, ultimately it's, it's a, it's a sales pitch more or less and sales is about telling a story. So it sounds like what you really want to do is you want to tell a story. Is that kind of along yeah, the right you, lines? You, you want to tell a story and, and you want to tell a good story. Um, I mean, just think about it. There, there's a reason that, uh, that, that, that every ancient culture has, has myths and those myths have, have, uh, have lived on to today. There's a, a reason that when Jesus was on, on earth, he, he taught using parables rather than lectures. Well, the, these things work. It, it communicates directly to the mind in a way where the defenses are down and your ability to learn is, is very high. Okay, that makes perfect sense. So 
One one mistake I've also seen, and, and you can maybe touch on this, but I saw where they went through every piece of the CapEx, like what they were going to fix about the project. Yeah, no. You, Something you, you want to talk about or no? No, uh, generally speaking, my presentations will have substantially less information than, than the original webinar that the syndicator provided. And again, it's not to say that the syndicator was wrong to provide that information. It's just that's not where it should be done. People don't really care if you have to replace the toilets. They, they don't really care if you're going to replace every little thing. It, it's, it's enough to say that uh, there, there's going to be some appliances replaced or some, some, some bathroom fixtures replaced or, or even less specific than that. I mean, uh, really what they care about ultimately is the numbers and whether they're going to uh, make, make any money. And so what you should do is, is kind of a, a, a very generalized description of what you plan to do with the property and why. And, but, but don't dig into the details because people don't understand or really need to know at that point. Yeah, there's such a thing as too much information. You know, you kind of want the less is more approach. Give just enough to have them interested and, and then build that scarcity, right? I feel like so many syndicators are, are afraid of being, you know, like, oh, well, we don't want them to think they, they can't, uh, you know, give, they can't uh, subscribe to the deal in two weeks. Yes, that's exactly what you want them to think. You, you very much want them to think that. And, and in fact, that, that's, that's something we focus on very, very specifically. Uh, I mean, for example, most syndicators, if they're raising five million bucks, let's say, um, and maybe hundred thousand dollars is the minimum investment, they'll say something like, "Well, we got to raise five million dollars, and and uh, we got to have all the money in two weeks. And if you're interested, you give us a call. You've got to put in, the, you know, our minimum investment's a hundred thousand dollars. But if if you have a little less than that, just give us a call, and we'll see if we can work it out. And uh, uh, you know, if you have any questions, let us know." Well, that's fine and that's all true, but another true way to say all of that information is to say something like, look, ladies and gentlemen, the, this project requires only $5 million. Uh, the project will be funded within two weeks. $100,000 is the minimum, and that, by the way, means we can only accept 50 people in, into this project at very maximum. Right now, there are 227 people on the line with us right now, and so uh, there's a good chance that if you're interested, you may not be able to participate if you uh, don't respond rather promptly. So it's my advice that you go ahead and, and, and give us a call right now so that we can talk with you and figure out if we're a good fit for each other. Now, I've said the same thing in two different ways, but the second way is going to make the phone ring. The first way is going to make people just think about it and go talk to their wife and, you know, put it off until next week and then next week, you know, the, another delay, et cetera, et cetera. My way, they call right now. Gosh, that's so powerful, right? You kind of play on that psychological side of the thing and really build that scarcity around the project. And ultimately what ends up happening is as you continue project to project, then you get language like, hey, the last deal was subscribed in 40, was full in 48 hours. You know, yeah. so now you're starting to really build that scarcity. And the next thing you know, it's just almost automatic, right? Yeah, I've even heard of people who don't even have, don't even get to the webinar. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. No, I, I, a number of my coaching clients are at that level right now. Where uh, I, I know one of them I worked with just a couple of months ago. We we even just wrote a little email and and that that did it. They didn't even have to do a webinar. Um, but yeah, I mean, there there is strategy to this, and once once you learn how to do it and do it quickly, uh, it's important to communicate to your database your results. Like whenever you raise very quickly, you you should be sure and let them know so that next time when it comes around. Uh, they'll, they'll, they'll have more reason from their own historical experience that they need to get involved right now. Absolutely. It's so powerful. So we kind of alluded to it in the beginning. You also raised for other types of projects. Did you start in real estate and then kind of expand to startups in oil and gas or kind of, kind of talk about that process? Yeah. You, you know, I, in, in the real estate space, I didn't really start doing syndications. What I started doing was helping connect people with uh, turnkey rental properties, single family turnkey rental properties back you know, decade or more ago. And then we ended up getting in, into syndications and such. But yeah, the, the, it's, essentially it turns out that uh, there was some, there's been demand for my services in, in other spaces as well. So we got into oil and gas, we got into uh, other private startups, particularly technology and finance oriented uh, startups and, and such. So uh, we, we do some of all of that and, and uh, I enjoy it all. We've, we've done other types of raises as well, but those are really where we focus. 
Awesome. And you, and you, we, I, I think we were talking offline or in the beginning about how you have a startup that you're raising for right now. Is there any difference in, in that process or what, what does that kind of look like? Just pure curiosity. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's different because the, the asset class is different, but it's not different because the, the buyer is not different. The investor is not different. We, we all have human psychology. It's the same psychology. I don't care if you're rich or poor, if you're, uh, you know, if you live here, you live there, it does not matter. Human psychology is the same thing for everybody everywhere. So the vast majority of it's the same. It's just the way that you describe the project and the way that you make the case is slightly different, but it's, it's, uh, uh, it, it's largely consistent from one project to the next. And we use the same structure of presentation just about every single time. Makes perfect sense. Yeah, like you said, I mean, we're still dealing with humans and the psychology of it. So one thing I want to touch on are what are kind of some of the, you know, sometimes capital raising, or if you say all you do is raise, primarily raise capital, there can be some misconceptions. Kind of touch on some of those misconceptions and, and why you, you think they're there. Well, I, I, I don't know what, what misconceptions you, you have in mind. I, I, I don't, uh, in the way that I do things, uh, particularly in the scenario that I described to you earlier, where I come in and, and redo the, uh, uh, the client's presentation so that they actually have something that's persuasive and makes sense. One of the things that surprises people in that scenario is that like, I don't offer to help them by using my database most of the time. There are exceptions, but the rule is that I don't, I, I don't offer to use my database to help raise funds for, for my clients. Um, all we do is we go back to their database with a much better presentation, a much clearer, much more persuasive way of, of saying the same thing. And that's basically always all that we have that we really have to do. So that's that's one big uh, uh, misconception, I would say, is, is that if you need a capital raiser, you're going to need somebody who's bringing in new blood. That that's one way to do it, but it's not the only way. And I, I contend it's not the best way. Got it. And yeah, I guess by misconception, I meant more along the lines of like compliance, right? Obviously, you know, if you are bringing in new, new investors, and that's when compliance can come in. But as you mentioned, by just going back to the same database that allows you to then just charge a fee and you haven't been in any yeah. sort of compliance. Yeah. And, and, and in, in that case, that's what I do is I, I just charge a fee for my services. I'm, I'm not charging X percent to raise money. I just charge a fee for creating the presentation and for coaching the client through the process of raising the capital. Because, you know, most syndicators, they, they've never really settled on this really centrally important idea. And that is that running a syndication and finding a great deal and making that great deal into a lot of money is a radically different skill set than raising the money. They're, they're radically different skill sets and they're unrelated completely. They have nothing to do with each other. And so that's, uh, that, that, that's, that's the part that I tend to focus on. And, and most of the time, unless it's a project that I'm involved in in some way, you know, should we, we just charge a flat fee for that. And it's, it's, there, there are no compliance issues there because I'm not being compensated in that way. Makes perfect sense. And personally, that's why I, you know, as I'm getting into the industry and really that's the skill I want to hone in the most because I feel like, you know, and that's why I joined Hunter's, uh, shout out to Hunter, his uh, mastermind Raise Masters, uh, which has been incredible because really, you know, like you said, as we've kind of alluded to, if you have this skill, then really you're going to get a seat at any table, right? Yeah. And just like how you've now moved into oil and gas and startups, it's a universal skill. Everybody needs someone who can raise capital. Yeah, yeah, Absolutely. It's, uh, it, it's, it's a good place to be. There's no doubt about that. Awesome. I love it. And then you also, do you syndicate and invest yourself? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I have run syndications myself in the past, which is why I don't do it anymore, because I don't enjoy that. Uh, and, you know, even when I was in the real estate business, I was reasonably successful at it, but I never enjoyed it. But what I do enjoy is, is raising capital and being being the person that connects people with particular dreams and interests and goals with the way to achieve those goals. Makes perfect sense. So uh, I think we, we mentioned, we talked about offline, you're not licensed. So let's 
play a scenario where you do need to bring in outside investors, are you then jumping on doing like a co-GP type model if it's a syndication? Well, the, the process is the same every single time. I talk with the client, we figure out what, uh, what we all want. And then we just call, call up my, uh, one of my attorneys and say, this is what we want. How can we do it? And if we can't, we don't. And if we can, we do. But there, there's, there's not one particular way that we do things. It's just that in, in this business, compliance really matters. Like this is a go to jail kind of business if you, if you get it wrong. And uh, I, have, I have no interest in stepping into the gray area. So Absolutely. that's our process every time. Yeah, I was a licensed uh, stockbroker for for many years, and you do not want to take on the SEC because they will win ten out of ten times. Yeah, and you're talking about never being able to do it again. It's not like a slap on the wrist or like, you know, hey, don't do that. It's like, oh yeah, you can't trade in securities for the rest of your life. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So uh, we we have a similar perspective on that. I just don't think that's that's a risk worth taking in any way. Love that. Awesome. Well, we're nearing the end here. I have five questions that I ask all of my guests and I've appreciated all this information, um, but they're called the final five questions. So the first one is the best advice you've gotten from a mentor. Wow. Uh, I, I would say that that is roundly or largely to uh, be a person of, of character, of quality of character above all else. Love that. That's awesome. What is it about your career that makes you feel like you're fulfilling your why? Oh, well, that's, that's really easy. Uh, I, I get, I have the uh, schedule flexibility such that I get to spend the first 90 minutes of every, every day with my two young sons, teaching them ancient history, Bible, and formal logic. That's how I start out every single day. So that, that's my answer to that. Oh, I love that. That's so awesome. So are they fully homeschooled? Yeah, that we, we homeschool them. Oh man, that's so awesome. I've been, I've been kind of going along that path as well, because you get, you now you're teaching them how to think yes, instead of what to think. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Gosh, I love that so much. What's your favorite non-real estate or investment related book? Ooh. Uh, so oh, there's one that I read very recently called the quest for the historical Adam. Um, I, I, I read almost no real estate stuff. My, my, my fascination is in philosophy, history, and theology. And so that one actually cro cross all of those lines. <laughs> awesome. I love that. I'll have to check that one out. If you could have any superpower, what would it be? Wow. Predicting the future. <laughs> that would, that would be useful for sure. <laughs> Cool. And last one, what's the best way for people to get a hold of you and, and learn more? Uh, they probably ought to just go over to accreditediq.com. Uh, there you can sign up for a uh, free subscription to Accredited IQ magazine. And uh, that's, uh, that, that'll give you a good peek into how we do what we do. And if you happen to be an accredited investor yourself, you'll probably get tremendous value out of the, out of the magazine itself. I love it. And we will link all that in the show notes. Brian, thank you so much. This has been incredible. It has been my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching today's episode. I hope you really enjoyed it. Listen, I know it's cliche and you hear it all the time, but please don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel so you know when the next video is coming out. Even though this is technically a daily podcast, you know it's coming out the next day. Um, we have a ton of content coming your way. So please like and subscribe. It helps a ton. Leave comments. We'd love to know what you guys think and uh, we will see you on the next one. Thanks so much.